And welcome back to Sunday Square Off. The NFL team from Washington, D.C. and the Major League Baseball team from Cleveland, Ohio would still play here, but under a bill now before the state legislature, you would not see their team names, the Redskins or the Indians, on the scoreboard or anywhere else at an Arizona sports stadium. The bill would give federally recognized tribes the power to ban disparaging team names at any pro or college sports venue that accepts public dollars simply by notifying the facility operator. Democratic State Representative Eric Deschini of Chinle sponsored the bill. He represents residents of the Navajo and Hopi Nations and many other tribes. Welcome to Square Off. Oh, thank you for having me. Why do these team names, why are they so offensive to many Native Americans? Well, you know, the real impetus is the Washington football team. Uh, it is a slur. I mean, that is a fact. I mean, the name originates at a time when segregation was normal. It was the, the cultural, uh, socially permissible type of uh, uh, landscape. And, uh, you know, really that particular name wa was used in uh, conveying to the public when they wanted uh, to murder someone, that was the bounty. And, and when you look at the documentation, it references the R word, which for many Native Americans, not just locally, but nationally, is uh, analogous to uh, the N word. There have been many attempts, uh, usually down, le down legal avenues, to try to get rid of this name. Why haven't they succeeded? Well, I'm glad you really brought that up because I think what's central to this issue is, is that, or what I'm starting to experience or in terms of the public uh, outcry, is that those lawsuits were rooted in the First Amendment, the Free Speech Clause. And this particular measure is not. This is about government speech. It has nothing to do with uh, free speech. And so, you know, the, those, those lawsuits, uh, um, you know, failed ultimately uh, because of the free speech. And uh, in this particular case, we were sensitive to that. And uh, my bill, HB 2499, it begins and ends with government facility, specifically the facility, which is to say that fans can come in and do everything that they always have. They can wear whatever they want to wear. They can say whatever they want to say. And the team can do this exact same thing these facilities, uh, specifically the structures of them. So you can occupy the facility and do whatever you want, but where the public dollars begin and end with this, with that building and the resources tied to it. And that's where we think, or you know, our, our community behind this say that government should not be implicitly or explicitly condoning racial slur. So you say it's not free speech, but it's government speech. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'm familiar with that uh, as a legal term. Yeah, yeah. But, so, but at the same time, it still would give one group of citizens, Native Americans or any other, any other group of citizens, might open the door to giving any other group of citizens power over what government can say, mm -hmm. basically censor government. Well, that's... And, that's the but, that's the democratic but, electoral process. To these, do, to, but there's yep. you know first law first amendment issues here. Well, a good example is and there's 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 precedent to this. The U.S. Supreme Court in 2015 asserted that uh, government speech is not barred by free speech, and that goes specific to a case in Texas where uh, in the, the case is Walker versus uh, Texas Division of Sons of Confederate Soldiers, where uh, a group of uh, citizens in Texas. Uh, sought a license plate that, that included the image of a Confederate flag. Well, that went all the way to this U.S. Supreme Court, and it was determined there, again, like I said, that uh, government is not barred by free speech, and rather the, the, the free will that we all prize so much is uh, governed by the democratic electoral process, and that's what, in this case, is we see as no different. So then any group would have the power to say, we don't like what the government is saying, and so you got government, you can't say it. If it's that's if, what this would open the door to it. The, the premise is, is that if it's offending a people, absolutely. I mean, there's there's no in this country through the democratic process uh, and also on a social fabric of things. You know, there's a there's a social norm that is either acceptable and not acceptable. And so through this process, which is what I'm doing, exercising the democratic exercise, you know, the, the, the process of introducing a bill to raise these issues and, and question whether or not government should be condoning whether it intends to or not, a racial slur. So there's a difficult issue here in your own district, St. John's High School. Their nickname is the Redskins. Mm -hmm. There's another high school with a, an offensive nickname. Why not start at home mm -hmm. and deal with this issue there? How has, how has that team name been allowed to last so long? That's, that's a very good question. 
the bigger, the biggest difference between, and it's just not St. John's, there's also Red, Mount, or Red Mesa High School, uh, which is predominantly uh, Navajo. Um, these are schools of education where you would hope that they begin to engage in critical analysis. My question to those schools is, what are we teaching our kids? Are, what kind of education are we getting? Uh, what kind of knowledge are we, are, we, are we putting out there? And I really question the schools um, to, to begin to introspect and reflect on whether or not we are going to continue to perpetuate a racist culture. And just so, so to, to, and to finish this point is, is that, you know, when we look at corporations who benefit, you know, make millions of to billions off of uh, racial slurs, you know, it, it begs the question, what really happens when that permeates all of society? It, it creates a, a society that makes things normal. And, and like we, said, we saw yesterday at the Capitol, where you have a pervasive cultural problem. Some of my colleagues on the floor observe that there is a fundamental problem that breeds, in this case, sexual harassment. Well, there's a, there's a fundamental problem in this country where when you turn a blind eye and do nothing about this, this cultural issue, it breeds problems. Right. And and I, we've got to wrap it there. Yep, yep. Uh, Representative Eric Deschini, thank you so much for joining oh, us. Thank you so much for having me. When we come back, Governor Doug Ducey makes some big promises about 2,000 jobs at new electric truck factory in Buckeye. How real are those jobs? We'll find out first. The week's sound bites taken out of context. Congratulations on managing your hydration successfully um, during the speech. <laughs> but more, more substantive. If only the lip gloss was so it was as successful. Deplorable and crumbs. Those two words, they seem to have a resemblance. I hope it has the same meaning. Does this at all seem familiar to you? Tidy whities We enacted the biggest tax cuts and reforms in American history. But he must be reading fake news. They talk like they do, but I don't think they do. What's that about? What is that about? Making sure everybody gets the Russia fever out of their system once and for all. Uh, back in my day, we didn't let Russians rig our elections. We used the Supreme Court like Americans. <laughs> oh, and by the way, I just got my copy of your new book, uh, Fire and Fury. So far, ba-da-ba-ba-ba, -ba -ba, I'm loving it. Okay.